So, the first question um, has come through. In light of all that we've heard today, how serious do you believe the crisis of child exposure to porn to be? And um, we're imagining that one might be, a, be able to be answered individually by each of you as we go uh, along the panel. So just again, in light of all that we've heard today, how serious do you believe the crisis of child exposure to porn to be? Starting from which end? Starting from you. <laughs> Obviously very serious. Uh, we've called it a, a public health crisis for a reason. More and more children are being exposed to porn earlier and earlier, and all the evidence presented today and all of the global literature tells us uh, that this is damaging to children's physical and, and mental health. And that's why we think there needs to be this conversation for a start and then exploring ways, ways forward. Yeah, high, very serious. All right. So I think it's very serious. I think I, I want to caution about a deterministic reading of it where, you know, someone watches porn and then it has this effect. I think we've heard something today about the complexity of the responses. Um, but I do think that it's really serious. And I think that, um, that if pornography is playing the significant role that it is for young people, then we, we have a very real chance that there's going to be a lot of lonely adults mm -hmm. and um, who, who don't understand how to do that intimacy and connection with another person. Uh, that's at one level. And also that, um, that perhaps don't understand how to explore mutual pleasure <coughs> and consent. And so, you know, at the other end, we've got um, people who are engaging in sexual assault and very coercive behaviours. And good respectful, intimate and other forms of relationships are really central to our sense of well-being and who we are as an individual. So I think it's, I think it's, really, it's really significant, but I don't want to sort of um, be hyperbolic about it either. Um, yeah, absolutely a serious issue. I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. We're a relatively small population, so if you look overseas to the UK and the US, which have much larger populations, therefore issues arising um, tend to bubble to the surface a whole lot quicker. Um, I think that's a really good point of reference for where we may be heading. But I think that there does need to be balance. Um, you know, it's not every child that views pornography is going to end up with a, a failed relationship and turn into a psychopathic sex pest. But certainly we need to understand that it's particularly damaging and it's always the vulnerable kids, the ones who don't have a significant adult in their life, don't have access to someone to talk to about what they're seeing, the ones who are going to have the problems. I, I, I pretty much said what I think the answer is to that. I think it is a public health crisis. I, I think that in order for people to listen in the broader community, we have to have some sharp statements about it. So, you know, I think the sharpness of statements sometimes gets the momentum towards change. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to, you know, the, the problem isn't... Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm a soft talker, so I'm um, I don't think that it necessarily means that we have to give up the complexity of it, but the sharpness is for a point. Um, yeah, look, I agree with the previous speakers, and I want to say that there are <coughs> countervailing trends as well. So, for example, among, among young people, there's also been an increase in support for gender equality, an increase in support for the notion that women and men should have the same rights and responsibilities. There's been some increase in uh, kind of norms of sexual consent, of the notion that you should seek the consent of your partner before doing something sexual and at each stage of sexual activity. So there are kind of contradictory trends among young people, both positive and negative. And, you know, there are negative trends too around sex and sexuality. But so I want to put what is undoubtedly a public health crisis in a broader context of both positive and negative trends among young people. Great, thank you. The, um, the next question is, and this has come up from a couple of people, is about approaching... Um, educating younger younger children so in, in schools so one of the one of the two or three questions that has come through which is similar is how would you explain to a 12 year old in year five or six what porn is in a sensitive way at school as a teacher 
they aware of so much at the school and home structure make it difficult. So in talking to 12 year olds in a school setting, uh, any advice, please? Okay, so, um, so I, I think that from when children are old enough to have devices, which for, in a lot of contexts is very young, we need to be having some level of conversation about pornography but we might not name pornography, in fact we wouldn't from when they're very young, but we can talk about that, the, that this device gives us access to it, the big world wide web and there's a lot of material on it and it's not all good. Some of it's rude, some of it's you know um, disrespectful of people, people aren't treated well and sometimes we might come across that and um, it's not good to keep watching it. So we want to keep those lines of communication open with carers and and parents and teachers so that we're encouraging that conversation, we're helping them to deconstruct what they're seeing and think through the values that they want to embrace and perhaps reject some of the, some of, you know, the values that we don't want them to embrace. Then as they get older we can have a more open conversation about um, by the time you're 12 you know that there is such a thing as sex. You might be interested in sex, you might be masturbating, so that means that we can have a conversation about that. We can talk about bodies, bodies being precious, that your body's precious, other people's bodies are precious. Sometimes we see things online or there is stuff exists online that is really disrespectful of other people's bodies and, um, and shows sex in ways that aren't realistic and you know, isn't what people really like, but it's sort of like an action movie has people driving all over the place. And you know when you get in the car each day, that's not how we drive. Mm -hmm. But because you don't see sex happening, you know, we don't want you to think that that's what sex looks like. So I think there's ways of having that conversation. And the conversation that you have with, an ind you know, with your child might be a different conversation than what teachers can have in a classroom. Um, or that you might have with a group of really at-risk 12-year-olds. You know, the con it, you need to be guided by your context. Um, the conversation that you might have with some different cultural groups and depending on the sex of the, of the facilitator or the teacher, you know, there's all sorts of complexities to take into account. But I think to, to um, affirm sexuality, to affirm bodies, to normalise masturbation, to, um, but to be able to help them to get a sense quite early on that there's stuff out there that's not great and that's out of sync with what you think matters for being healthy and you know, being, treating people well. Um, I also think one of the other things that the Australian curriculum refers to in terms of uh, competencies that we want young people to develop is, is an understanding of influencing <coughs> factors. And we all have a whole range of influencing factors in our lives. Families, friends, you know, the media, a whole range of contexts. And some of those are healthier influencing factors than others. And so, but it's sometimes when influencing factors are really strong, they can just seem that that's what's normal. You know, that this is just how it is in life. But it's not necessarily. People have different influencing factors. And so we want to develop young people's capacity to understand that we can make choices about the influencing factors in our lives as well. And we can choose to reject some of the influencing factors that might seem normal. Yeah, and I'm, I'm with Marie on that. I start to talk in my presentations at grade three about the sharing of naked photos. I do it using language that children understand. Um, and then the language changes as I grow up through the years. But it's certainly, and it can also be linked into protective behavior lessons where we talk about our body and who can touch them and what safe touching is and unsafe touching and all that. So it's got to have a holistic approach. It's got to, it can't be just a you know, standalone thing. Nothing works as a silo. It needs to be linked into um, protective behaviour, sex education, respectful relationships. And it's not that much different to teaching children that there's good and bad out in the real world and there are things that we are going to avoid and things that will upset us that are not real, um, that the movies are make-believe. Um, a movie that you see on the internet is often make-believe as well. So there's a lot of things out in the real world or the physical world that you can take and you can use to link and to help you have those conversations. And if you um, give children analogies and things that they can, they know in the real world um, that they can play off, the level of understanding is a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I should have also said that in order for those comms, I think you're absolutely right, it needs to be in that broader context. And part of that broader context in a school should be that the policies, that the, the, um, 
but the professional learning for staff, the parent engagement and partnership in this work, community partnership, all of these things are part of the picture. And if the kids are at a school where you talk about respect and then you have a culture of disrespect from staff to students or between students, then it undermines that education. So part of the broader context that it needs to occur in, apart from you just don't have a separate form talk, it needs to be in media literacy, relationships and sexuality education, you know, protective behaviours, that are all of those different areas. It needs to be within a holistic approach that re where the, the key messages are reinforced in multiple ways. So keeping safe, I'm a lollipop lady. So if you want to keep your kids safe, you can use that as a way in to a degree. Um, by telling them, don't run across the road. Watch me. <laughs> Parents come across the road all the time. Hurry up, the lady's got a job to do. That's my job to slow them down, you know. <laughs> so that's one way of getting into the holistic approach, would you say? That's a good way to do it anyway. <laughs> Thanks to Marie and uh, Susan for responding to that, which has also gone away to answering a couple of other questions that were more related around parenting, so I think that's been covered there as well. Um, a question, Susan, um, around a couple of people have sent in something around other laws and criminal offences that you can tell us about in regards to porn. And the question actually came up from someone in the last session as well um, about whether um, showing pornography to a child was a criminal offence as well. So perhaps if you can help us with some of those, uh, that'd be great. Um, in relation to the laws, obviously um, pornography itself um, by and large is, is legal unless you're talking about um, illegal concepts that are, that are captured such as bestiality and things like that. So if we look at just um, legal pornography, um, as an adult it's your right to view it, you can show it to another consenting adult if you like. If you start to show pornography to a child and that's a person under the age of 18 years in most states and territories in Australia, South Australia has a couple of strange laws uh, where for sexual offences they use the age of 16. It can be offences such as showing or sharing object objectionable content. Um, there are a range of offences out there in every state and territory in Australia as well as Commonwealth law that every state and territory must obey as well that would cover an adult that is showing an a, a child pornography. There's even offences there if an adult takes naked photos of themselves and sends them to a child, that's also share objectionable content, so that's a criminal offence, and that's designed obviously to protect children um, from adults that might be grooming them and normalising the behaviour by sending lots of sexual imagery to them. Um, the sharing of sexual imagery between teenagers in every state and territory in Australia other than Victoria is a criminal offence and it's child pornography. Um, the laws have not kept pace with that at the moment. Uh, Victoria does have some new laws, came in last August, that basically not so much decriminalises children showing these images, but ensures that if they are showing these images um, and certain situations occur, they're not going to be treated like a um, person with a pedophile. They're not treated the same way as uh, a traditional sex pest, um, which means that they don't get placed on the sex offenders register for being something that essentially is um, adolescent stupidity or sexual exploitation. We also have some new laws in Victoria about revenge pornography. And although there's a lot of hue and cry in the media all the time about the fact that we need these laws, we've already got them. Um, under Commonwealth law, sharing of intimate images or threatening to share them is covered. But Victoria has specific revenge porn laws and they're the only state that has those. Those laws apply to everyone, doesn't matter whether you're a child or an adult. I know I'm another member of the panel, but can I ask, those revenge pornography laws, don't they not apply if someone was a consenting party in the production of the No, no, it's no. No, not at all. Um, if I have, um, say I'm in, in a relationship or I'm not in a relationship and I choose to share a naked image with someone because that's my choice, um, <laughs> and that person then threatens to on-share it or does on-share it, it's a criminal offence. Some offences like Section 80. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's uh, an, a number of questions basically asking, given and, and probably leading on from um, David's talk about uh, what's happening in the UK, what, do, what can we do now? So one of them says, uh, can we start a movement like the UK to make government force ISP default filters in Australia or does this have to wait until the inquiry is complete? 
Um, the UK experience saw a groundswell of support from the community, organisations and government to protect children. What are the next steps we need to take to achieve the same here in Australia? So a number of, three, three or four or five questions of similar um, ilk of what, what we can do to help support that if, uh, if we want to. We need David on the panel for that one. David, would you like to? Any submissions to the inquiry would, would be helpful, any of you who have the capacity to do that, uh, anyone can make a submission. Uh, you can write to your um, uh, federal MPs and express your support uh, for this uh, for things to move in that direction. Um, and I think beyond that, it's wide open. Uh, they, they can all, it's quite fascinating. I just gave, for those of you who heard that talk, I just gave a, an overview of some of the things that happened. But they, they, there was an awful lot of creative things uh, happening they went in front of uh, British Telecom with big blocks and, uh, and made uh, this big thing that said block porn. And, uh, and then they got the media to show up and get photos and stuff. So it just, it's a matter of getting creative, I think. If, if that's something uh, that we think we, if those of us, we think it's a good idea to do that, there's a lot of um, avenues to pursue, I think, to start a campaign. You know, the, we're at the early stages in Australia because uh, there's been some resistance. Thanks. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't seen yet, well, the back page within your uh, brochure actually has a little bit of information about the uh, Senate inquiry and, uh, and when uh, the invitations are opened uh, prior to the 10th of March 2016, if you'd like to contribute to that. Perhaps for the researchers here, is there any uh, much scholarly research on the benefits of porn? I don't know why I could speak to that. Um, anyway, um, look, the, one thing I didn't say, I, I was talking about um, the, the, there's three typical benefits that people identify to pornography. One is in terms of kind of sexual knowledge and sexual, sexual exploration, that uh, you know, pornography is a source of information about sex and bodies, and certainly pornography is one place where sex is celebrated for sex's sake. And that does seem to me, you know, that's a good thing. Sex is a pleasurable part of human experience like a very nice meal or a walk in a meadow, not exactly like those things, but <laughs> has some similarities with those things. And, you know, so, so, so sexually explicit imagery in some ways celebrates that. Um, but having said that, you know, I think you're, you've heard enough from me this morning to know that I'm also very critical of what passes for pornography um, in contemporary Australia and elsewhere. Um, so what, that's one benefit. And a second benefit is some, some people claim that pornography is good for their relationship, for their sexual lives. And the research on that is fairly interesting. It does show that men's pornography use tends to be poor for relationship satisfaction. There's at least one study that shows that women's pornography use is good for relationship satisfaction. But I suspect there's complex things going on there, in fact, that are, that are worth untangling. And the third thing that people have pointed to is that pornography is one place where you see affirmations of diverse sexualities in a culture where we still silence and marginalise and pathologise um, gay and lesbian sexualities and queer sexualities and so on. Um, and I think none of those really is a killer argument in terms of uh, anything that's been said today. I think we can acknowledge versions of or aspects of those benefits and still point to what is an industry that in so many powerful ways um, is deeply damaging for women and women's sexual and emotional lives, for men in various ways, and for <coughs> children and young people. And so I think, you know, we can hopefully make kind of sex positive, if you like, sex positive arguments for what's wrong with pornography while also defending um, uh, adults' rights to explore their sexual lives in various kinds of ways. Thanks, Michael. There's a question here, a couple actually, um, related to uh, in confronting the problem of porn and its impact on all people in society, how do we engage males in a dialogue that doesn't make them feel that they are part of the collective perpetrators? Well, they're not a, they're not a collective perpetrator if they decide not to be a collective perpetrator. Uh, so we've fortunately got many young men joining our movement. I'm speaking for Collective Shout here young men that have come to us and said uh, we are tired of, we are really harmed by the damaging messages about masculinity that we're receiving in media and popular culture and in porn every day and they've recognised that the conditioning of pornography, uh, the, the way that pornography tra trains them and teaches them uh, to, be, to be callous and to be cruel and to get off on eroticising violence against women is damaging to them as well. 
And so they're the men that we're really, really happy to work with. And we have more and more, thankfully, coming forward, uh, recognising that um, porn culture is toxic to them, uh, to them as well. But you know, we, we need men to decide this for themselves. Like a lot of people say to us, what are you doing for men? What are you doing for men? You know, do we need to bring a plate and write it in their diary and organize a barbecue or something? Like, it would just be great to see, which we are starting to see, I must say, and Andrew, you've been part of this conversation for a while. Um, I shouldn't have said that, should I? But um, we are starting to see men, fortunately, decide that they don't want to be part of that sort of perpetrator class of, of men that have been conditioned around a message to do with m male entitlement to do whatever they want, any time, any place, anywhere. Can I comment on that as well? Yeah. Um, I mean, many men, I don't know what proportion of men, but many men who use pornography feel a sense of shame about their use of pornography. And in a sense, that's a resource. That's a resource with, yeah. with which to sort of, you know, raise the conversation about the fact that many men know that the poor pornography they're using and masturbating to isn't actually very nice and doesn't actually show women in very respectful ways. And their female partners would be horrified to know they use porn in those ways, or even if they do know and turn a blind eye, it's not a very good thing for their sense of self and how they view their partners and the kinds of sex they want to have. So that sense of shame is a resource and can be used to invite a more kind of ethical stance on pornography. And you know, I think one of the challenges is speaking to men in ways that do hold them responsible, do hold us responsible for our complicity in gender inequalities, our complicity in sexism, our complicity in violence against women, and that also um, invite us to play a positive role and speak to the positive roles that many men already do play and the care and support and love that many men already do feel for women in their lives. So I think it's a kind of balancing act of speaking to the positive on starting with the positives in men's lives on the one hand, mm -hmm. and also having a kind of an ethical or a moral language about the harms associated with pornography and the need to make ethical decisions mm -hmm. to stop using pornography or use better pornography controversially or to you know do something different. A part of what I talk about when I deliver a full day of training when I've got a bit longer is um, when I talk about it, I think it can be really confronting to have a gendered analysis of the harms of pornography. At, but nonetheless, we have to have a gendered analysis of violence against women and of the harms of pornography. And none of us is free from the unearned privileges or disadvantages that we have as a result of our gender, our sexual orientation, our ethnic background, our socioeconomic status. We're not free from those, but what we have choices about is what we do with our unearned advantages or disadvantages. And so I'm a white, heterosexual, educated woman. I have some privileges and I have choices about what I do with them. So in that, I stand in solidarity with men who have some privileges. I, I get what it's like to have some privileges. We all have to make some choices about what we do with those privileges. So I think there's ways of inviting in a very collegial way, you know, in a collaborative way, um, all people to be part of, the, of this action. It's not an us and them. It's, um, it's about how we work together, owning the realities of the situation and having some humility about it. Thanks, Marie and Michael. This one, uh, on a bit of a similar theme to what you were starting to say there, Marie, um, I've heard a lot today about the effect of porn on young men and how it provides them permission giving beliefs and other negative consequences, but what is the effect of porn on young women, specifically in relation to their own self-worth and body image? If porn causes a boy to see girls as sexual objects, how does porn consumption by girls not also suddenly instill in them similar feelings about themselves? After all, every porn actress is somebody's daughter. Melinda. So just to clarify, the question is about... The, is effect, it about the effect of porn on young women, but I believe it's really a, about them yeah, watching... You, watching it watching and watching using it. Yeah. Well, I think that contributes to young women internalising uh, their own victimisation and, and you, you know, what the reason, which I talked about today, the research tells us that where in the past a young woman might have thought something was assaultive, now she thinks, well, I'm meant to enjoy it because in porn women love that stuff. Women get off on everything. Uh, no actually means yes. And, uh, you know, violent degrading acts are depicted in a way that shows women enjoying them, which is research that Marie mentioned today as well about the majority of most popularly looked at porn videos uh, 
show women being aggressed against and more significantly women enjoying that aggression. So any young woman that watches, watches that type of pornography is going to be learning that she's, she's submissive, that she exists for male pleasure and, and entitlement. She's in essentially a, a, a sex aid for a, a man to enjoy and it's not really about her pleasure or her sense of intimacy or authentic connection. It's really about a, a service that she plays uh, as a service station for, for men and boys. So I think that would be my response. And I think part of the question was about bodies as well. Oh, and yeah, and in, in recent years, we've seen significant increases in rates of breast augmentations, labiaplasty, anal increase. bleaching. Mm -hmm. And a lot of commentators, including some plastic surgeons, are making connections between the mainstreaming of pornography and those increases. So I think in a whole range of ways, yeah. Pornography is influencing how young women feel about themselves yeah. and what's expected of them, of their bodies and of who they are and what you know, they're meant to look like, what they're meant to look like, yeah. how they're meant to perform, right. what yeah. they're meant to perform. Yeah. Thanks, Marie. So, John. Well, just, just from a sort of clinical perspective, we're seeing more girls uh, present in our programs than we traditionally have. Mm -hmm. so that what everyone said in terms of how it gets played out in the you know, in psychology and the, you know, in the inside of, it, of the young woman is it was still kind of it, it, you can I can caricature it, I can say a little bit about what it looks like from observing it, but it it, it doesn't it, it's part of what I think says to people. What it shows us is that young women get angry often. Mm -hmm. They get, um, they, sh they show their, their frustration and humiliation uh, in a way that wants to, um, for example, act that out so that someone else can feel what they had to be subjected to themselves or what they've seen others in porn um, be subjected to. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, this is a kind of complex area for Good. For, our, for our understanding, I don't think we, from our point of view, have even come close to yet seeing, you know, getting a, a handle on how it is that it gets translated into behaviour. But the reality is that young women are part of the programs that we're seeing and they're engaging in. Um, the the behaviour is different. It's not the same as what young boys do. And I think it comes from from that submissive spot that they have to, that they're exposed to, mm -hmm. um, and it's in response to that. How, I, you know, we need another few years still to be able to kind of really decipher that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. This question, I notice that there are not a great deal of younger people here today, under 21, and you've spoken about what we can do as teachers or parents, etc. but what can we do as students and peers to support those around us? and change pornography norms in young people? Well, there's people here that would have been in, in the youth breakout session. Hands up if you're in that, that youth breakout session. So, so that, was, that question was really discussed there, and uh, some of the young people had some, some really great ideas to do with uh, mutual support, to do with programs that exist online, uh, ways of speaking out, joining together. I think there's some, going to be some really creative new ways forward coming out of that last session. Uh, it might be good to ask Laura or Nick maybe to give a, a quick round up of, of that session because that mm. really goes to the heart of that question. Um, Laura, are you in the room? Is that all right to do that? She's not under 21, but she's tw just turned 24. Is that okay? <laughs> 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 um, my name is Laura and Nick up back there as well we just ran a little breakout group and um, it was really encouraging because it just we were able to identify that there's a real gap in the market and I think that gap that we identified was that we don't have enough open spaces for young people to come and talk to people about their issues with pornography and that's, whether that's addiction with young people, which is rampant, as we know, but also for people who aren't, you know, addicted to it, but affected by it. And I think the conclusion that we came to just in that half an hour or hour, however long we had, was that we need to encourage more education, 
but also more empowerment over the young people to make their own choices in this space. Because it's really easy to just like continue blasting all these facts at them, but until they can, you know, really be empowered to make their own decision and feel a part of something greater that's really benefiting them, they're just going to see it as a set of rules. And so I think, you know, we really identified that there needs to be something built in that space. I was super encouraged by everyone who was just really, you know, keen to get involved in something. And I think moving forward in this, I can definitely see potential to start something along those lines. So I don't know whether that answers the question, but that was what was discussed. That was great. Well done, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question about what do you think about labels like food, porn, etc., that are making porn fun and acceptable? Mm. <laughs> Is it dinner time yet? Do you want me to... I, I don't know. I don't go to the wall on that, really. Um, pick your battles and, yeah, I suppose it does make it light-hearted. But, you know, I enjoy pictures of food on Instagram. Maybe <laughs> 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 that's the hashtag. That's a really bad answer. I don't know. What do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, yeah. I'm not going to go to the wall on that. Probably. It'll be called something else next year. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to quickly scroll down here and find another question. Is there any research on the knowledge levels of teenagers on the harms of porn, Australia or abroad? For example, 50% of porn users know that it can lead to sexual dysfunction or addiction, etc. So do we know anything of that stats? Uh, off the top of my head, where's Michael when you need him? Yeah, Michael's um, conveniently there. Off the top of my head, there was a study in the UK um, that asked young people about whether they think porn is harmful. Um, IPPR, is it? Yeah, IPPR. IPPR? Yeah. Do you know what it said? <laughs> I think they said that it was problematic. Might yeah, have had that yeah, third they person they effect. Did, yeah, so 500... Um, I was talking to Joe about this in the break before we went on. 500... 12 to 17 year olds, I think. And they, um, yeah, they interview boys and girls, um, and the results were remarkably different from the boys and girls around the harms, um, around the benefits as well. So, and that was one of the things is that they saw one of the benefits of porn was the fact that it did educate around sex, where there was currently a vacuum around education. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the item here, yeah, I, mean, I think it's called, it's, I think the report was called It's Time We Talk. No, 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 that's, that's my strange. That's 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 <laughs> 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 but, it, but it was IFWPR, I think. And I think, oh, you know Liz. Well, that's what I mentioned in my talk. That was the big colourful sign. So I can make that sign. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
mimic it in any way. It's a question along those lines. What should future pornography research delve into, given ethical and measurement difficulties, correlation, causation, the cost of longitudinal designs? Where should budding researchers pitch their focus? <laughs> we need to know more about young people's access to pornography. So often in research, there's not a distinction made between exposure and access. We need to know more about how much... So we need to know more in Australia in general. Our research about porn is often international. Um, we need to know about what young people are watching, how long for, how regularly, why they're watching it, what they understand from it how it relates to their attitudes, how it relates to their behaviours, whether they feel like their use is compulsive, you know, whether they're comfortable with their level of use, what the gender differences are, what it means for levels of coercion in relationships and expectations around sexual practices. Um, we need to know more about interventions and how effective they are. Um, there's so many things. We need to know more about, um, I think there needs to be data collected by police and by clinicians who are working with young people with sexually abusive behaviours, pe um, people who are working in the sexual assault field, where we have, you know, um, I can't remember what we call them, but sections in your forms that are filled out that help us start to get a picture of this. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to Victoria Police about this years ago, they said, oh, our data system is so old and just to make any change like that, it costs it's hopeless. It's hopeless. Mm -hmm. and, and just to give you an idea of how hopeless the data collection is in relation to cyber stuff, when I was doing my research in Big Poll, we looked at how many young people had been charged with the offence of stalking, which in those days was the only offence you could be charged with if you were cyber bullying someone, and it is still one of the offences. And neither did Victoria Police, nor the Magistrates Court, nor the Children's Court keep any data other than Tom Smith was charged with stalking. It didn't say whether what sort of stalking it was. It didn't say whether it was done electronically. It didn't say whether it was done, you know, I followed you around. And in order to work out what type of stalking it was and whether it was a cyber issue, you had to manually open every single crime report and read the narrative. Mm. They have not changed. Mm. And in all honesty, in the way technology works, it's, it should be a tick the box. Um, our data collection is appalling. Courts don't do it. Um, the sexual health places, the sexual assault places don't do great data and police are next to useless. Can I add some more research? We need to know more about the protective factors and the risk factors for young people's access to pornography and um, how that relates to their behaviours. We need to know more about what it means for young people with disability and cognitive impairments in particular. We need to know more about what it means for young people who are same-sex attracted or um, gender diverse, how they're how, what their access and exposure is, what the meaning is that they're giving to it, how it's impacting on them. Um, and there are a whole lot of different population groups that we need to understand some more about this, about including um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups, and that's many groups, um, and different cultural backgrounds. So that's... And they big numbers. Yeah. D don't tell me you've surveyed 200 people. <laughs> yeah. Not enough. We, we need... You don't get a good picture unless you get... <laughs> Really nice big numbers. Thank you. Sorry, John. That's the telling. You know, like if you, if we're sharp about this issue, that's the telling um, kind of element to what we're talking about. Is how how um, high on the agenda is a problem that doesn't have a research agenda to it. How high is it on the agenda? when there's not the funding or the availability of resources to, to try to understand. That's the circle, because you don't get there until you get there, and then that doesn't yeah. come until you get there. Yeah, so, so. I think they, that, I mean, we basically need to know everything. Don't yeah. We yeah. need yeah. to know a lot. a lot. There's more. a lot we don't know. That's we right. know some things that we can build on, yeah. so, you know, significantly, but we need to know a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. So whoever asked that question, is a couple of decades work at least there for you. <laughs> <laughs> I work with a lot of children and work a lot with dirt. Um, and getting data is very difficult because of privacy, because of all sorts of things. It's not just a case of it needs to be on the agenda. There's a lot of issues around how you can collect that data. Mm -hmm. And fair enough, actually. Like yeah, very agree. sensitive no, I agree. issues. Because yeah. I have often thought, my gosh, I can see patterns, I'd love to do this, do that. But it's very, very strictly 
controls, and I think it needs to come in from sort of top down. We do need to get, I think, some government interest in this, some you know validation around why we need it. I think it needs to start from there because at the moment it's almost impossible to pass on information, or it's very, very tightly controlled. And just to study it would be really difficult at this point. Thank you. Um, here's a suggestion. In the past, stigma has been an effective cultural mechanism to shun certain practices, smoking, environmental degradation, violence against women. What about stigmatising porn, making something only wimpy people do? Soft love, uncool, not real, or tough love is. Might this be more of an effective approach to turning the conversation around? <laughs> I'm not sure how effective stigma is. I mean, I, th I think if you drink and drive, you're a bloody idiot. You know, I mean, I don't know the research on... I know that we've had really successful campaigns around smoking and drink driving and seatbelts. But I don't know what the logic is around the stigma because I actually think, although Michael mentioned before that shame is a useful resource, it's also a dangerous resource. And... Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like the underground, people don't get help. Yeah. That sort of thing. That's, pa that's part of the risk, I think. Mm. There is a, I mean, there is a, there's a dynamic within pornography that is, that speaks to things that are vulnerable in adults. I mean, that's, that's the, the issue. Um, drinking and driving is someone else's problem. Smoking so can be someone else's problem. But I think with, with pornography, because it touches sexuality, it, it speaks to some parts in us and, and within that we carry both shame and celebration of shame and respect. I mean, it, it, I, don't, I think we have to sort of be open a little bit about that because that's, certainly that's what kids bring when they start talking about it is they bring with them an experience of shame but an experience of pleasure, an experience of, of something that's rewarding and reinforcing for them. I don't know that that uh, amplifying one element, one or other of those elements will actually lead to a change. It, it, I'm not saying that it won't, but I, I think that we've, we've had too long a history of uh, polarised responses to this for kids. As far as I can see, we, we either disregard it and minimise it, or we, we overreact often not all the time, but we, we, kids can certainly get an overreaction to it. And, and what, what they need, what kids need, what family needs, is, is a way of understanding their specific set of circumstances and what it is that's, that's led to them in, in the process. And the number one issue that parents come to us with is shame. It is absolutely, will my child now, as a result of showing us that he can do this, become a sex offender down the track. And that is immobilising for them. And it takes a lot because they actually have to be the resource to their children in the change process. And that, I wonder whether that's the kind of messaging that we might get out if we go too heavy on the, on the wimpy process. I, I don't know. We've got people an out, you know? Yeah, yeah. We've got about three minutes to go and I'd like to get through a couple more questions. The person who texted about the air conditioning coming back on, that's just been sorted for you. <laughs> and probably the back half of the room, I imagine, they are blaming their yeah. booklets. Um, so, a 30 second response. One of you, to give a 30 second response, first in on the buzzer for these, uh, these questions. What about countries such as Holland with more open sex ed? What are young people's responses to porn there? Similar. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, 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 similar. Out of seconds if you want. maybe there's some there's there's some good stuff around um, being more open, but the phenomenon of porn's influence and its shaping of sexual practices is is international, and some of those Nordic countries that are quite open that some of the best research around its impact on behaviours is from there. Thank you, Marie. Is all this an argument for same sex schools? No. <laughs> it's a problem in every school, same sex and not same sex. Yeah. Are there stats on porn addiction slash habits and divorce rate? Not amongst young people. 
point. Uh, I think there is something I've read about uh, when porn was listed as a causal factor in marriage breakdowns. I've read something. Um, I don't know how good the research was, but there's certainly something About 15 years ago, prior to that, no, it wasn't yeah. listed at all. No. After it listed, about 34% of divorces cited the porn as an issue with a contributing issue to the divorce. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. I think we will need to leave it there. Okay. Thank you very much to the panel. Sorry that we didn't get through every question, but I appreciate the time. And I would like to hand over to Coralie to finish off the afternoon for us. So thank you, Coralie. Um, firstly, I just want to thank, um, on behalf of Collective Shout and the team, um, our amazing speakers um, for donating their time to be a part of this event today. I'm totally in awe of the expertise on the panel um, and the breakout sessions. Um, I have personally learned so much today trying to absorb um, the wealth of knowledge and all of the information on this topic, it, it really is um, overwhelming as we know that we've had so many different um, angles um, to look at from this one topic of pornography and harms to children specifically. So um, can everyone please thank our speakers who've been... <laughs> that Collective Share have been concerned about for a long time and we're hearing these stories in schools as we go around and uh, five months ago we had this conversation and we thought about Safer Internet Day and we, we thought can we pull this off you know in this period of time can we get this calibre um, of speakers from around Australia in and pull off an event of this scale and um, as I stand here today, I'm just so proud of all the team and everybody that's been involved in, in making this happen and just the professionalism that has come from this and there's been so many people behind the scenes that have helped and, and volunteered their time and really gone above and beyond. So um, thank you to everyone who's also been involved. That's been really, really um, just, we couldn't have done it without you. Um, so about the research and, and uh, what more still needs to be done in this space. It certainly feels to me like it's, it's still in that starting point um, and we've still got a long way to go. And so we don't want this to just be a one-off event um, that we came, we talked about the harms and then we all went back to life as normal. So um, we want to be continuing to look into this. I know a lot of people here um, probably would consider themselves activists. A lot of our collective shout people are campaigners and activists in this space. And I feel like we need to um, just mobilise ourselves and go, OK, what can we do from here? How can we be involved? It's not someone else's problem. I think that came through today as well. We need you know, parents, educators, government, community organisations, everybody working together um, to what the solutions might be. So I'll just reiterate as well about the Senate inquiry. Um, uh, I know that there's a range of organisations represented here today with staff coming from different organisations. If you've got the capacity to um, submit something, please do so. It's March 10th, which is the closing date for that. And also I'm going to be um, discussing with our team to really pull out what are the key points from today. I know that especially um, the media are waiting to see what is it that were the, the major themes that were coming through across the day. So we're going to be pulling together those themes, putting them into a list. Um, most of you who have registered are um, on the Porn Harms Kids mailing list. We've got the website pornharmskids.org.au. Uh, please keep an eye on that website. Um, we will be emailing you all throughout the week um, with what, these, what are the major themes from this and let's see where we can take this um, in terms of people being able to add their voice um, to that and saying, yes, this is a problem. Um, we think that it is getting to that crisis point. We need to do something about it and let's see what can, can come from that. 
Um, we're certainly open to people's suggestions as well. Please email us if other people have ideas about what solutions could be to this problem that haven't been discussed through a range of speakers today. Um, please feel free to contact us about that so that we can continue the conversation. But we're going to be having some drinks, as has been mentioned, after such a heavy topic. We would love to be able to just, uh, yeah, chat casually with you all and debrief about it. If you're able to come and join us for that, please do so. Everybody is welcome. But thank you so much for being involved today. And um, yeah, we're really pleased that we can be part of this conversation with you all. Thank you.